You guys have been sitting a long time. I'm going to just do a quick exercise before I begin my talk. It's really quick. It only takes like 10 seconds. So I just need you to stand up. Okay. You guys following me? So I just need you to say this one word. Bojo. So that's a verbal agreement in my language. That means we're going to learn from each other today and we're going to respect each other. So this is how I teach young children how to say bojo. So you can teach your, your younger siblings this, okay? First part is this. Shh. Can you guys do that? Second part is this. Third part is this. Last part is whoa. And you jump up. Okay. So the key is, I tell children, is do this as loud, as loud, as loud, as loud as you can. Right? Shout through the, to the rooftops. Because we're... Wayne Bojo was a spiritual being in our creation story for Anishinaabe. So we're saying hello to Wayne Bojo. And the, the process I just showed you was the, an idea of the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> you guys ready? You don't sound ready. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Okay, let's do this. Shh. Whoa. You guys are pretty lame. I've heard grade twos louder than you. One more time, one last time. Whoa! Awesome, awesome, much better. You guys can have a seat. Thank you for doing that with me. So the reason why I sounded the drum four times is to acknowledge the four directions. Wabnanung, Jawanung, Nangabeyanung, Kuwaitanung in my language. And I followed it up with a beat to acknowledge the creators of Giji Manitou's first thoughts, first sounds of the universe, but also the sounds of the thunder beings, the thunderbirds. And the Thunderbirds to the Anishinaabe are the protectors, the protectors of the human beings. And you can find evidence of the Animkeeg Thunderbirds in Agawa Bay, just north of Sault Ste. Marie. There's pictographs there, which is where some of my people are from. So I'm Anishinaabe. And that means human being in the Ojibwe language. And today, I'm going to tell you a story of a human being. Ah, when bojo, bojo, noting and dishnakaz, chichak dorem, waring em snabi kri and dunjaba, anishnabe nene and dao. Chimigwach wabnanung, jao nung, ngabe nung, kiwede nung, chimigwach mazi kikwe. Chimigoch Mashomas Gizes, Chimigoch Nok Mister Begizes, Chimigoch Manoba Matsuin. And so when I say that in my language, I'm acknowledging the universe. I'm acknowledging my place in the universe. And for the longest time, I couldn't do that. I had no idea on how to begin that. I had no idea on how to teach children how to say hello to Wena Bojo. I had no idea. Why didn't I have an idea? Because of the indigenous narrative in Canada and throughout North America. There has been a huge omission of information. Sorry, just quickly. Timer's not working. And I don't want to go over time. Okay. All right. So the, why there has been a, a huge omission in information is because the Canadian narrative around the world is not inclusive of Indigenous people. So in terms of equilibrium, there's an inequality, inequality here. 
There's a, the balance is off. And my teachers and my traditional teachers and spiritual people have told me that whenever we think about the good and the bad, we should always think about positive and negative. Because without the negative, we can't have the positive. Without the positive, we can't have the negative. Negative things in our life are there to teach us things, teach us things about ourselves, so that we can reflect, introspect, change, transform, help it unf- help a- use the information to inform our current location. So as Anishinaabe, when we say that announcement, we're locating ourselves to the universe. We say our spirit name, our Anishinaabe knows when, that is given to us at birth, usually by our grandparents. We indicate our location or where we're from. I'm from the place of the rapids. My father's from Missinabi Cree. I said my clan. My clan is my purpose and my role to my community. I'm Chichuk, the echo maker, the crane. We are designated by the people to bring forth the voice of the community to other nations, just like I'm doing right now. That is our sole responsibility. But as a young person being born into poverty, marginalization, my household didn't have any evidence of culture. My grandparents spoke three dialects of Anishinaabe Moen or Ojibwe, but they didn't teach me because they wanted me to learn English. And this became a practice within Canada to separate Indigenous people from their culture, who they are. So there's a sense of placelessness. So as I'm traveling through the territory here, there's barely any evidence or reflection of the Indigenous people here. When you go to places like Toronto, same thing. When you go to Vancouver, there is indicators of the the Indigenous people in that, that area, that territory. So we have to reflect and face ourselves in terms of what is the truth here. If we're going to move towards this call to action in terms of reconciliation. So I've used the process in my own life to help me understand my role as a leader, as a spokesperson, as a husband, as a father, as a teacher. And it's been a process of kinship, introspection, and transformation. So I'm going to share a couple quick stories with you. So as a young person growing up in Toronto, I was like one of two Indigenous people in the whole school. And there was no reflection of who we were. So there was no inclusive education of Indigenous ways of knowing. That's the new word for culture. Indigenous ways of knowing. But when I went to senior kindergarten this one day, And sometimes we have these unexpected allies in our life. It was a senior kindergarten teacher that took me by the hand up to the second floor to visit with a visiting indigenous artist who had his artwork laid all up against the lockers. And being from the 70s and seeing Star Wars in the theater, (laughs) one of the things that struck me about this artist was just how cool he was at the time. Might not be cool these days, but he had long flowing hair and as he moved, it kind of like moved in the wind and he had this jean shirt that was kind of open to his like his navel and he had these bell-bottom jeans with these leather sandals. And the first question he came up and asked me as a, as a five-year-old, it's a big question. He asked me, what kind of Indian are you? And I didn't know how to respond. And I shrugged my shoulders and said, I don't know, Indian. And I went home and I asked my family, what kind of Indians are we? And they said, we're Anishinaabe, we're Ojibwe. And so at that point, I felt a kinship to something bigger than I, I was, a nation. A nation, I felt connected to my nationhood as, as an Ojibwe person. But the only evidence I could connect to was these objectified images within media, within school books, that were always in the past, stereotypes, athletic teams. 
movies, this globalization of this objectified image of who indigenous people are, but not really who we are. Because if you get to know some of us, even within this territory, you'll find out that we have indigenous methodologies and sciences, technology. This drum is a form of technology. And so, thinking about that, senior kindergarten, that was a big question to answer. The second time I connected with my culture was when I was visiting my uncles in prison at eight years old. And so not knowing any different because I was so used to having turmoil and violence and abuse around me, going to a prison didn't seem like a big deal. But as I walked into the prison, I heard the sound of the drum, I, swelt the, I smelt the sweet, sweet smell of sweet grass. Sweet grass is a medicine for us as Anishinaabe, we use it for cleansing. And I just felt this sense of home, this sense of belonging. And it was a weird place to feel that sense of belonging within a prison, visiting my incarcerated uncles. It's not something normal that you hear in a person's narrative. But the interesting thing about my narrative is it's not really unique to me. As you start listening to the indigenous narrative right across this country, you'll find that most, a lot of indigenous people have the same or similar narrative. And so when, when I met this priest, in my grandparents' church, the Native People's Parish, he showed me the four medicines. He took us on a fast or vision quest up near Dreamer's Rock. He introduced us to this beautiful elder. And it was the first time in my life I actually sat out in the land and reflected on who I was and all the mistakes I made. Because when you're sitting out there on the earth or in nature or within forest, within the forest, you're forced to face yourself. So facing myself led me to the drum. The drum led me to different healers, elders. And one of the most significant elders I met in my life helped me transform into the person I am today. Because I didn't go to high school like you. I dropped out when I was 14. I was incarcerated. I was on the streets. All those kinds of things. All that kind of turmoil was happening in my life. But I found the, the time to do a confirmation even though I'm not religious today. And the priest that I was talking about allowed me to pick my saint. And the saint that I selected was Crazy Horse. Because at the time, I was feeding my brain with literature of leadership from all over the world. And so that was informing my location. So that when I came to this point of meeting this elder, leadership was on my mind. So he helped me connect to who I was and to who I am today. And the first thing he did was he gave me my spirit name when I was around 19 years old. And he told me I needed to fast again. So I went out in a fast. I had an experience there. And I received a song. I'm going to share that song with you. This song <coughs> that I received on my fast, the name of it is Ogichita. And Ogichita in my language means a person of great heart. Yeah, 
So when I came back with that song, it took me to a different understanding of who I was as an Anishinaabe. Faced with all the statistics, social determinants of health, we're leading statistics in every possible area. One in two First Nations children live in poverty today. We have some of the highest suicide rates in the world here in Canada, in indigenous communities. There's over 130 communities on boil water advisories. So in terms of this role that you're going to occupy in your life through this process of kinship, introspection, and transformation, one of the things I want to leave you with is this understanding of leadership and the balance of leadership. For the crane, the chichuk is the echo maker. And the symbolism behind the crane is that we carry the community on our shoulders. And the cranes will carry smaller birds on its back when they're flying south. It's a common belief right around the world. So my question to you, in reigniting that sacred fire within your, within your spirit, understanding your role in the universe or your location, my question to you is, who is balancing on your shoulders? like the crane, and whose shoulders are you balancing on? Miigwech. <laughs>